Salutation, my esteemed students of Siege Warfare. Today we are examining a weapon that represents Roman sophistication to a T, and one that modern scholars got wrong for decades. I'm talking about the Cairo Ballista, not to be confused with the Cairo Ballista, we'll touch on the differences in this video. The Cairo Ballista. This is Rome's personal precision artillery that has ranges comparable to medieval heavy crossbows. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, yeah. Professor, this is just a crossbow. What's the big deal? Well, my curious student, that question tells me you haven't been paying attention to my lectures. The Romans are famous for their engineering. Comment down below your favorite example of Roman engineering. It doesn't need to be warfare related, it can be anything Roman engineering related at all. This weapon probably is my favorite example of Roman engineering. Some might argue it's not over engineering, but some might argue that it is. Picture this, if you will, it's 101 AD, and you're a Roman legionnaire, and in your kit is the equivalency of the ancient sniper rifle. For three centuries, the Romans refined this design and created something so sophisticated, we truly wouldn't understand it until the year 2000. This weapon was brought to my attention from a dear viewer. He commented down below telling me about this weapon, saying he has done some research himself on it and sent me over a ton of cool documents, including a bunch of images you're gonna see in this video. I don't know if he wants to be named, but if he comments, I will point him out in the comments below. I just wanna say thank you so much, dear viewer, for this information. I love this kind of stuff. I love the community we're building here. Not to say there isn't a siege community, I'm just trying to create my own. I also love learning about siege weapons, so thank you for commenting and letting me know about these weapons. I would like to give you guys a quick disclaimer as well. I am not a historian, did not go to school for history. I am not a professor. I just play both of those things on the internet. This disclaimer goes for this video and all my videos. To steal a quote from Dan Carlin of Hardcore History and many other things, I am a fan of history and I wanna share this love of history with the world. I want to educate, I do, but I wanna do it in an entertaining way. When it comes to researching for my videos, I read a section of a book or two about the weapon or siege device that I'm currently researching and I'll read some articles online, of course the Wikipedia page if it has one, I'll scour some old Roman army for Forms or ancient army forms that I find from like the early 2000s and I'll read those. I try to be thorough. I'm not gonna 100% fact check all my sources, I'm gonna be honest. I'm trying to create a video a week. I know it's more like a video every week and a half, but I'm trying to create these videos at a decent speed for you guys. With all that being said though, if I ever misconstrue some information or say something that's wrong or something that isn't factually correct, please comment below letting me know. I will admit my faults. I can easily misinterpret things. I can easily read a source that isn't completely factual. Um, to steal another quote from one of my favorite humans in history, one of my favorite humans in general, Marcus Aurelius, it is, if someone is able to show me that what I think or do is not right, I will happily change, for I seek the truth. The truth by which no one was ever harmed. It is the person who continues in his self-deception and ignorance who is harmed. Basically saying, I'm not looking to be correct. I'm willing to set my ego aside. It is the truth that I'm after. So comment down below if I get anything wrong. With that huge disclaimer out of the way, let's get right back to the Cairo Ballistra. <laughs> The Cairo Ballistra's story begins with Huron of Alexandria, as does many siege weapons. He gives us the mechanical designs, but it took 300 years of Roman refinement to make this weapon a reality. Beginning with the base of the Gastrofetus in 399 BC, Romans and Greeks would patch and balance this, progressively making the torsion system. One of the first torsion weapons used by the Romans was their Roman Scorpio. Very venerable, very famous weapon. All that progression and innovation would culminate late in the first century AD with this iron framed masterpiece of a weapon. This weapon enters the siege meta to our knowledge 
in Trajan's Dacian Wars of 101 to 106 AD, where the archaeological evidence shows us they were deployed. Trajan's column itself actually depicts these weapons being used. It's carved in stone. I do need to note, we are mostly seeing the Caro Ballista, as mentioned before. This is the cart-mounted brother of the Cairo Ballistra. The Cairo Ballistra was carried by an individual soldier, not mounted on a cart. But here's where the story gets interesting or depressing, depending how you feel about sophisticated siege engineering. The Cairo Ballistra would remain tactically effective throughout its entire lifespan, but it would be replaced or fall out of favor of the soldiers as they would choose a simpler weapon platform over this complicated engineering marvel. But also late stage Imperial Rome struggled to maintain the three critical elements for this weapon. Those three being high quality iron, highly skilled craftsmen, and highly skilled soldiers trained on using this weapon. The decline of the Cairo Ballistra goes hand in hand with the decline of Roman sophistication. That's to say it goes hand in hand with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. By the fourth century BC, it was getting systematically replaced. That's not to say the Cairo Ballistra stopped being effective. It was to say that Rome was fundamentally changing itself. First are the artificers, those dedicated artillery specialists who would manufacture, repair, and maintain these weapon platforms. Heck, they probably operated them too. They became increasingly expensive to maintain. Each legion would require a number of these specialized troops. These men would understand torsion systems, spring tensioning, and precision manufacturing. By the fourth century AD, Rome was facing a lot of barbarian pressure and they had their economic struggles too. Maintaining these specialists became a luxury that many commanders could not afford. Second was the iron. Iron costs skyrocketed. The Cairo Ballistra required a lot of iron for its frame to be built. Not just iron, it required high quality iron. But iron was expensive. And meanwhile, the weapon that the empire began to favor, the Onager, required minimal metal components in order to be built. When you're trying to supply your army with weapons on a shrinking budget and during a multiple front war, the economic choice, it, it does become obvious, even if that means accepting inferior performance. And third, and perhaps the most telling of the examples, the Roman military was becoming increasingly reliant on barbarian auxiliaries. These auxiliaries would come with their own weapons, their own fighting culture, and their own training. These soldiers were oftentimes excellent fighters, but they haven't grown up in the Roman specialized training. Trying to teach a Germanic warrior how to operate and maintain a precision weapon plat was quite the ask when you could just give him an onager and he can probably figure it out a lot better. And this is where the onager really begins to take over. The Onager represents everything the Cairo Ballistra wasn't. It was simple, it was cheap, and it was maintainable by anyone with basic carpentry skills with any local materials. The Cairo Ballistra featured standardized precision manufacturing across the empire. That meant if you have your Cairo Ballistra up in Britain and it breaks down for whatever reason, but before you can get it fixed there, you get shipped to Egypt, Theoretically, those workshops would know how to make the parts for your Cairo Ballistra and you could replace them. That's replaceable parts in the first and second century AD. That's basically science fiction at this point. But the Onager could be repaired by some dude who has carpentry as a hobby. He has an ax laying around, you can go cut down a tree. You're gonna choose a functioning weapon, even if you lose some flex points, if it means it will actually shoot and you're able to repair it. Fourth century sources showed that the Cairo Ballistra remained effective throughout its entire deployment. It remained effective when properly operated and maintained. Just properly operated and maintained became more and more difficult to achieve. This transition marked a fundamental change in the Roman Empire. It went from sophisticated engineering military solutions to pragmatic economic choices in the military. This is the part of the story that really breaks my heart. The empire that standardized artillery deployment in the field across three continents was now making decisions based upon what was the cheapest, simplest to maintain, and could be repaired locally. And with all that depressing business out of the way, let's get to just talking about the Cairo Ballistra's weapons specifications. This is a fact. 
fascinating story. For decades, modern scholars are trying to wrap their heads around the ancient sources, trying to get the same performance out of a modern recreation of this weapon. The venerable E.W. Marston, they thought there was no way with the small torsion springs given to us from the ancient sources that they could achieve the power this weapon supposedly had. This led them to arbitrarily enlarge the spring diameter, which had tons of downstream effects on the operation of the rest of the weapon. Then in 2000, I'm gonna butcher this guy's name. I think it's Itor Ira Arti. Itor Ira Arti, his name's here. He had a crazy idea. He was like, what if we followed the ancient sources to a T? Let's just see what happens. And he reconstructed the weapon according to the ancient sources. The key measurement was the spring diameter of the torsion springs. It was one and one third dactyls, about 25 millimeters in modern measurements. This single detail changed everything. The weapon's technical specifications when built to the ancient sources are as follows. Its weight went to nine kilograms. The previous historians that tried building them had monstrosities of upwards of 27 kilograms. You're not carrying 27 kilograms around as a weapon. Nine kilograms? That's heavy, but manageable. Its range was probably just over 200 meters. Composite bows of the time could reach out to 200 meters, though that was a long stretch. Given that this weapon was probably a little more powerful than those, we can infer that it would reach out to over 200 meters. That's comparable to a medieval heavy crossbow. Velocity was measured at 86 meters per second, a very respectable speed of a dart. Operating the weapon was also extremely simple. It was an individual weapon platform and could be cocked by pressing it against the ground using your body weight, just like the gastrofetus. This is mechanical advantage, allowing you to draw more weight back by using your body's weight to its advantage. I also read somewhere, I don't know where this source was, but the operators, when they were down cocking it, would grab the arms of the weapon and pull them back as well. Its construction was iron framed. Iron is a lot heavier than wood, but it is also a lot stronger. This allows you to actually achieve more torsion power with less material weight than wood. Though the body was still made out of wood, if you made this entire thing out of iron, that's gonna be really heavy. And all this was operated by a single crewman. The engineering here is so sophisticated, but realistic. Torsion was the way to get more power out of bows before we understood spring steel. Torsion springs store energy through the twisting of their springs. I've explained torsion on this channel many a times. I'm not gonna go into too much detail right here. The gastrofetus is arguably just a crossbow, but they quickly hit the limits of the bows that they could build. Thus, torsion was introduced to surpass those limits. With the advent of understanding metallurgy a little better, we could create steels that were a lot springier than any iron of the time. This springy steel, spring steel, is what would bring the crossbow back into the meta. You can get a very simple weapon with a lot of power. So Itor, previously mentioned guy who rebuilt it according to the ancient sources, he also had another brilliant idea. I don't know if he got this from the sources or he thought about it, I don't know where he came up with it, but on a regular ballista, you can see the arms are on the outside of the torsion box and come back kind of like this. He had a crazy idea of an in-swinging ballista. So the arms are pointing forward when it's discharged and it rotates down and inward. Those were actually found. Archaeological evidence was found of those. They were found at what was called the Hatra site. There was eight bronze corner fittings that proved his idea. But this is where I've got to be honest with you guys about the sources we're using here. Our knowledge of how the Cairo ballista was used in battle, if it ever was, it's basically non-existent. I didn't really find any actual accounts of it being used on the battlefield. The Cairo Ballista, the one mounted on the cart, was used, but the personal weapon platform, the Cairo Ballista, I can't really find any records of it. If you found records of it, please show me it. I would love to know how this weapon performed. What the sources tell us is Huron of Alexandria gives us detailed technical specifications of the weapon, but not how it's used on the battlefield. Vegetigius, writing in the late fourth century AD, provides organizational details of this weapon being deployed on the battlefield, but again, it was the Cairo Ballista being deployed on the battlefield, not the Cairo Ballistra. So was this weapon ever used in actual battle? I don't know. I like to believe that it was. I like to believe that there were special forces of Roman soldiers with like 10, 12 of these things flanking around the enemy, getting behind, popping up out of the woods, guerrilla warfare style, discharging their bolts on high value targets, sniping down enemy generals or siege commanders. And then they could fire a couple times before the enemy knows what's hitting them, get out of there could use that 200 meter range to great effect if they were allowed to. I wish this was real. I don't know if it was. I highly doubt that special forces did it. 
I don't even know if it was used on the battlefield. I just really want it to be used on the battlefield. Would I want the job of building or using a Cairo Ballistra? Um, yeah, I would love the job. Building these things would, I would, I would take so much pride in building these things. I would engrave the wooden body. I would make the iron frames all shiny and polished. Though that would probably rust, so they probably wouldn't be shiny and polished. I'd probably have to like coat them in like the carbonized oil. I would get like the local holy man to bless them, to give them some holy damage for every bolt they discharged. If I was given the chance to operate these suckers, I would be sitting awake in the siege camp all night just slinging bolts over into the enemy siege camp. That'd be so much fun. You could like play games with your friends. Like you, you could mount them up on like a grassy knoll and try to hit a high value target over in the siege camp. And whoever hits it gets like the extra wine ration for the night. But honestly, we have no details of how this weapon was actually deployed. So I don't know if I would want this job. In addition to that, I think building them would probably be more of like a quantity versus quality thing. So I feel like it'd be more of like a manufacturing role rather than like a special artificer building holy weapons. Maybe I wouldn't want the job. We can say though that you would be operating the pinnacle of engineering, a sophisticated weapon on the battlefield that represents cutting edge military technology of the time. Research and development is paying off. And this leads us to Professor Siege Captain's 100% historically accurate ranking of the Cairo Ballistra. I'm giving the Cairo Ballistra a C tier ranking. I know, it kills me ranking the coolest siege weapon in history this low on the tier list. The technical specifications alone are crazy. 200 plus meters range, only nine kilograms, operated by a single troop, in swinging arms. This weapon is a true unit, a true specimen. The apex weapon of Rome. I'm a sucker for ballistas. This weapon represents 300 years of Roman research and development. It's comparable to a medieval heavy crossbow. It is a complex weapon that modern scholars struggle to recreate. That is some excellent high class engineering. So why a C tier? We have significant gaps in our understanding of the weapon. If it truly was this effective, I think the Romans would have found a way to deploy it more often on the battlefield. It might have been extremely effective, we just don't have the sources for it. It wasn't effective enough though for a simpler weapon to replace it. But the Onager didn't really replace it, it was just favored by the troops, so it was replaced in a way. Also, I can't give it higher on the siege tier list because it's not really a siege weapon. It's like, it, it is just a personal bow for shooting other people. This would be like calling a composite bow a siege weapon. It's not a siege weapon. It's a weapon, just not a siege weapon. That's why I'm giving it a C tier and not any higher on the tier list. I love this weapon, but I have to be historically accurate here. The Cairo Ballistra is a perfect example of Roman engineering and the difficulties of modern interpretations. It is a reminder to distinguish between the ancient sources and what modern scholars infer. Modern scholars don't always get it right. The ancient sources aren't always telling us the truth. And sometimes the gaps in our knowledge are just as important as what we actually know. As always though, I am an eternal student. Drop a comment below. What was your favorite fact you learned today? Also, as I said before, let me know if I got anything wrong. If you want a better place to continue the siege dialogue between myself and you, the dear viewer, I made a subreddit. It's called Siege Weapons of History. It's quite great. Every Monday we go over a siege device. I call it Siege Machine Monday. I would love to discuss siege weapons with you all night over on that subreddit. Also, thank you so much for watching. We have a finite time on this planet. It's the one resource we're not getting any more of and you chose to spend some of it with me. That really means a lot. I greatly appreciate it, dear viewer. Let's sally forth, build some overcomplicated siege devices, and siege the day. Class dismiss you highly trained artillery men. If this weapon was popular in the late first century AD, that means my man Marcus probably got to see this weapon used. Marcus, I'm kind of jealous. Come here, purper. Oh. This here is Purr Purr. Now you might think she's called Purr Purr because she's a cat and she Purr Purr. No, that's not the case. We call her Purr Purr because her full name is Persephone. So we call her Purr Purr, P-E-R, P-E-R. She's a big softy. 
She's the only one of our cats that when we have guests over, she comes up and greets them just wholeheartedly ready for pets. She loves being pet. Now the trick is gonna be trying to get her to leave. Purper, -pur. there's history that needs to be discussed. Do you like my recording setup, Purper? Fourth century sources showed, that's a tongue twister. Fourth century sources showed, fourth century sources, fourth century sources showed,